was in Michigan that came down and had us for lunch one day. I think, it, I think it's the Monday night football effect. Oh, yeah, that's true. Sure. <laughs> they're dancing with the stars. The seniors are playing with There will be football. I want to, uh, did anybody have something they want to start with tonight? I found this just from Urban Joe. Okay. It's got one second for Okay, I'm going to let you show that in a minute. I want to read, uh, this is from uh, Revelations of Divine Love by uh, Dame Julian of Norwich. And uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's probably, I could probably do that in about five, ten minutes, but my voice probably won't do that. But I'm, I'm just going to share a, a bit of the words. Uh, and this is, uh, revelations of divine love is kind of a reflection of, of visions that she had. Revelations, uh, you could call them visions, and there are states of altered consciousness that she's had when she. Uh, these words come to her. Uh, she says, In this same time, our Lord showed me. Shewed me, S H E W E D, a spiritual sight of his homely loving. I saw that he is to us everything that is good and comfortable for us. He is our clothing, that which that for love wrappeth us, claspeth us, and also encloses. Oh boy, that's what it is. <laughs> Closeth us for tender love, that he may never leave us, being to us all things. That is good as to mine understanding. Also in this, he showed me a little thing, the quantity of a hazelnut in the palm of my hand. And it was as round as a ball. I looked thereupon with the eye of my understanding and thought, what may this be? And it was answered generally thus, it is all that is made. And I marveled how it might last. For we thought it might suddenly have fallen to naught for littleness. And I was answered in my understanding, it lasteth and ever shall last, for that God loveth it. And so all things hath that being by the love of God. In this little thing I saw three properties. The first is that God made it. The second is that God loveth it. And the third that God keepeth it. But what is to me verily the maker, the keeper, and the lover, I cannot tell. For till I am substantially owned to him, I may never have full rest, nor very bliss. That is to say, till I be so fastened to him, that there is right not that is made to fixed my God and me. The wording is a little bit different, but... Uh, Again, her revelation or her how she understands things given to her. Do you want to share your prayer? And we will open. This is from Reuben Job. I'm sure some he was editor of, of the Upper Room for a number of years. It's a it's a prayer. God of immeasurable love, incomprehensible compassion, unbending goodness, unyielding justice, and mercy without end. Come now to guide us, 
companion and sustain us as we seek only your will and grace to follow your direction. Save us from careless words, reckless judgments, unwilling hearts, and divisive acts. Save us for careful listening, gentle words, rigorous thought, loving actions, and faithfulness to your high calling. We have promised to love you and our neighbor with our entire being. By the power of your spirit, grant us grace to live up to our promise. Thank you for your loving kindness, hearing our prayers, and accepting our lives as we offer them to you anew. In the name and the spirit of our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom we belong. Amen. 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 Thank you. Now, Reuben Job uh, uh, has written several things. He was, uh, I guess, executive director of the Board of Discipleship. Uh, or, uh, I, don't, I think that was his title. But it, Bishop Reuben Job, uh, and uh, one of our retired bishops. Uh, he wrote. Uh, Three simple words. Three simple rules. Do yeah. anybody know what, what those three simple rules are? Well, that was Jesus' greatest commandment, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, Reuben Job wrote this little book, Three Simple Rules, but it based off of John Wesley's state, statement of three simple rules. Do no harm, do no good, and uh, do no harm, do good. Do no harm, do good, and always be in love with God. Amen. Very good. Well done. Well, I can't take any credit for because that's what Tony said on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got prompted. <laughs> you remember? Yeah. <laughs> that's too fair. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, that, those are, that's the three simple rules. Do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. And I think that's important for us to understand tonight because the key, uh, one of the key uh, understandings from this chapter that we're looking at tonight is worship. And there was a line in the book that I, uh, in your study guide, that I really liked, and it's at the top of page 30, 35. And... Uh, uh, well, it's not exactly at the top. It's the, it's the first line of the paragraph of the elders. And it says, the elders perform three actions in their worship that represent their inner posture of being. That, that word, inner posture of being, I think is is a key phrase. Uh, I invite you to underline that because uh, when, uh, as we just kind of keep that in the back of the mind as we talk about you know, worship and the other things tonight because that really is what's at the, at the, the heart of the worship. Um, I, uh, I want us to do a little exercise <coughs> tonight. Um, as we get started, and I think I'm just going to kind of divide the class in two. Uh, and and uh, if you're on the right, my right, if you're on my right, uh, I would like for you to uh, to take a look at the passage uh, from the fourth chapter, the second through the eighth verses. And if you're on my left hand here, go to the 21st chapter and look at the verses 10 through 27. Now, if you've already answered that in, in your workbook, um, uh, that was uh, question number two in your workbook, but if you've already done that, fine, you're already ready to go, but take, let's take a little time, and I want you to go to those, one of those uh, passages, and in a few moments, we're going to talk about the structure of heaven uh, as uh, described in those two uh, uh, structure of heaven and New Jerusalem as described in those uh, two passages. So I'll give you just a few moments to take a look at one of them. You don't have to do both of them. Just pick one and do it. <laughs> I 
Does anybody need a need a Bible? I've got. I can get one. Get one out here. Yeah. Huh? You need one, Ramona? Oh, okay. Anybody else need one? Huh? Is it King James? Huh? Should be. It's a, it's a revised standard. It's not the new revised standard. Okay. It's a revised standard. Thank you, Ed. St. Paul's hasn't moved into the 21st century yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't even moved into the 20th now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ed, you've been recorded. <laughs> that isn't the first time that I've said that. some characteristics of heaven. What uh, of gold? What else is in? Uh, what was? What else is described there for heaven? It seems very loud. It talks about lightning and thunder. In that, in that, that, uh, glass. glass. That's what clear. Yeah, clear. Transparent. Glass. Tell me about some of the furnishings. Was there, no? there was a throne. Uh, um, surrounded by 24 thrones, evidently one special throne. The book of the and on the 24 thrones were 24 elders in white garments and golden crowns. So people wearing white, or uh, we, we'll say uh, uh, beings wearing white. What was in front of the throne? 
Now, uh, Streets of Gold. So we got 12 gates, 12 foundations. Uh, is there a throne? Why don't we need a throne? The whole presence of the land. So the present presence of God uh, is throughout. Okay. Well, that's good enough. But just, but you see that there are some comparisons uh, to to that and uh, and the connections there. Um, I, uh, when you look at the, uh, the questions or in the reading, what was uh, in the reading, what did he say the significance of the, the scroll being written on both sides and having seven seals? It being, uh, it, there's a completeness of of sealing it. I mean, with both being uh, completeness of sealing it, plus the completeness of there not being any more space to, to write uh, on the scroll. And if you remember at the end of Revelation, it says you're not supposed to add anything to the vision. Uh, it's, this is, uh, the connection is that this is a vision of God's purpose. And one of the things that we can add on to is God's purpose. And that's, that's what the scroll represents. The scroll represents God's purposes for creation. And these, uh, these four beings, uh, four creatures, uh, what did the author indicate that those four creatures represent? Those four creatures represent the whole of created order. The one looks like a one has a oh, right. has yeah, a face, yeah. has the head of a lion. The other has oh, right. a, yeah. a, a lamb and a foot and a, the no it's Eagle? lion um, ox, ox, ox human yeah. and eagle. So you got uh, I don't know. I don't know how that represents, but that comes out of the Old Testament uh, traditions of that representing those four creatures representing all created order. I mean, uh, I would, based upon our understanding of the created order, it would be uh, probably be some fish and some reptiles and some other things in there, but uh, this is. Uh, um, but in any case, that those four beings are symbolic of the created order and the purposes of, of God associated with that. And this idea that this this is the scroll of, uh, scroll representing God's purposes, but it's not just a thought. What is the significance of right hand? Did Action. anybody look up and see what that is? Action. Action. So it's not that just God has a purpose planned. It's that God is working that plan primarily. Uh, and that plan uh, was as we get further 
on in, uh, in chapter 5, we realize that there's a, there's a problem getting to look in that scroll uh, that no one can open the scroll except one is found. Who is the Lamb, the Lamb of God, Jesus. Um, and I had an interesting thought as I was reading this. I, you know, we could probably say that, well, Jesus, because he was the Son of God and, and because of his purity and because of uh, uh, those connections, he is, open, he is able then to open the scroll. But the reality is, when did the scroll get opened? Uh, when was, before the beginning of time. Before the beginning of time. Because, and, and definitely through, through the life and uh, resurrection of Jesus on earth. Because Jesus was the one who could make God's purposes and plans and purposes real to us in living it out in, in our space and time. Well, we know that Jesus was present with God at the creation. At the beginning of okay. time. And the whole thing about being the Son of God, that only refers to the incarnation life of Jesus. Right. So Jesus has a life before the incarnation, then life on earth, then has a life after. So in a way, thinking of Jesus as the Son of God is very limiting. It's it, it is. a small period of time. That's not really what he is in my view, but he's the same thing as God. Just right. a different aspect somehow of God. A person. Uh, uh, yeah. That in, God in was able to send a little part of his spirit down and become a human being, you know, but that was just a very temporary thing. Uh, but it was it was that, I, I, I guess as I picked from the, the reading, and again, this was just a thought that hit me that, that is a, the purpose, everything that was in the scroll <laughs> is wrapped up in what Jesus did on earth. Uh, he played, in other words, he acted out, uh, he became God's right hand on earth. Uh, he became the action of God's purpose among us uh, and uh, you know that that helped me understand why the, the vision indicates he's the one to open the scroll yeah uh, I must have missed something where, where does it indicate that the scroll was open before the beginning of time uh, it's not necessarily here in in this but the, the reality is that if Jesus is the one to open the scroll, and and the scroll represents God's purpose. God's purpose is there from the beginning, and Jesus was the one who was opening that scroll to all creation. I mean, that's that's how I'm reasoning out what I'm uh, understanding that the vision is trying to tell us. In other words, it's. What we're looking at here is not, what we're looking at in the vision, we have to get out of the mindset that the vision is looking necessarily just in the future. Hmm. The vision is basically outside of time. It's outside of time. Outside of time. It's beyond time, but it, it goes, as we look at it, it goes to our past as well as to the present as well as to the future. So it, it encompasses all of that. And so therefore, if, if Jesus is involved and Jesus is the one who becomes God's right hand and to open the scroll, then it, that just kind of follows in terms of, of my thinking. I think it's like John is, is getting a vision in, in a way from God's viewpoint where he's able to look at, you know, here's creation and here's whatever something. And, you know, we're going along, you know, in a linear fashion, but God is looking at it in a perpendicular way and seeing the whole thing at once. And so John gets that vantage point in, in those moments of the vision to see kind of from God's viewpoint the whole thing at once. Yeah, that's, that's the difficulty about the, I guess it's the beauty of the vision, 
but it's also the difficulty of us trying to understand it based upon written word and language. We can't understand it in terms of you know linear time. And like right. people are trying to say, well, this happens after such and such. No, 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 no. That, yeah. no it's, a, it's a whole thing all right. the time at once, experienced in an instant. So we can't really comprehend that in any rational way. So the vision, we started out in the chapter one through uh, three, looking at addressing the church, those seven churches, the church as it was at that point in time. And now we're looking at what heaven is and was at a particular point in time, uh, as it's described uh, in, in the vision. Uh, and and the, way, uh, the way the author looks at it, he says, John's vision began by addressing the church this is right at the beginning of this chapter. And uh, what is to take place after this, the profound reality is in which the church is involved and the citizens of New Jerusalem fall back. And then everything goes after this. And we all, all of a sudden jump into a deeper dynamic of, uh, of heaven. Um, John starts out in the in chapter 4 again reminding us that he's in the spirit reminding us that the vision continues that it's not a new vision he's continuing in the spirit he's in the altered state of consciousness whatever that that is that allows him to have have this vision this isn't a new vision i mean you don't have the vision of the seven churches and then have the vision of, of a deeper heaven it's it's all one vision and, uh, uh, I think they only describe one thing at a time. Yeah, he can only talk about one thing at a time. And he's better than most of us. Some of us can't even do that. So, uh, but uh, also to to remember that some of the jewels that are uh, that are described that we wrote about here are jewels from the breastplate of priests in the Old Testament. So that, again, that tie, tie to uh, uh, the, the Old Testament. Uh, uh, an interesting point that he wants us to remember, even as we continue on through, is here on page 34 in your study guide. Uh, he said, uh, white robes are closely associated with the redeemed people of God. They re represent the essential being of those who have been conformed to the image of Christ. In the rest of the vision, no heavenly being is clothed in white, only the redeemed. Uh, uh, in terms of being clothed in white. Now white will be used to uh, uh, when we get to chapter uh, uh, next week. We get to session five and six, uh, we will see that there's. Uh, we'll be looking at the colors. Colors are going to show up again. Uh, in terms of that. Um, throughout this, what is really taking place? What is taking place in in all of this? I mean, we talked about. We have the. The 24 elders, uh, we have the four creatures, uh, we have uh, other beings. The trumpet is going all this time. Uh, They're worshiping. What, what is happening? I heard the word worship. Worship, worship is taking place. Worship is taking place. And uh, what is the, uh, the key element of... Uh, what is the key element of, of the worship that uh, we're seeing uh, shared there? Is it just acknowledging, is worship just acknowledging God? Their, their attitude, you talked about their inward posture, it's their attitude, and it's ingrained. It's the real them. 
Can I acknowledge that that God exists without having an attitude of worship? Oh, yeah, the saint does. I like what he says in this one sentence where he said, um, Worship of God is not merely an outward observance, but a deep inner orientation of being by which God is enthroned in the totality of one's life. Yeah, isn't that neat? It's a good word. I mean, a a good sentence. The the fact is, it's about it's about our inner. How have we placed Christ or God in our lives? Where where is that? Uh, And uh, there's been a lot of metaphors used, I think, over over the years. Uh, uh, One, I think, even Jesus used the metaphor of. a man who, uh, you know, cleared out all the all the um, uh, what am I trying to say? all the devils out of his life. He, he gets all his devils, but if he doesn't if he doesn't fill that space within his in, within his inner being, more devils come and get there. So so that that idea is that. Our inner being is a place where God needs to fill that that space. Uh, some people have called it our uh, our God void or whatever that God shaped yeah. void in, in our lives. That we need that, but it's that aspect of having God in our lives is. Uh, I think central to the idea that what what are the elders doing? First of first of all, they're they're dealing, right? But that's not the biggest thing that they do. They cast their crowns. And what does the author tell us that 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 action? What is action? What does that represent? Yielding one's life to God's control. Turning it all over. Mm-hmm. We're taking we're taking our control over our own life and giving it giving it to, to God. We're we're saying, and so here's the real crazy thing. It says, God, you have control over all my resources. I give you control over my pocketbook. That's probably the hardest thing we in this country have to give give God is our pocketbook. Uh, that after uh, offering, you know, everything we have is what He's given us. Well, it is. I mean, that that's the truth of it. But but we want to keep it. <laughs> we don't want to give it back. Uh, we don't want to allow Him to use the resources that God has given us to do to try to accomplish God's purposes. Uh, and I, I think this is the biggest argument that I have with, with people who have great inordinate wealth uh, is that they have chosen to keep control over, over that and, turn and, and not give God the, the total use of that. Because I have a feeling God would use it a lot differently than yeah. <laughs> many people are using it. Yeah. So, uh, I. But that's probably one of the other things. What are, What are some of the other things that we have a hard time turning loose of, turning control over? Uh, Our time. Yeah. Time. Time. Yeah. We don't. Uh, and, and I'd have to say this from the perspective of of a pastor uh, and a retired pastor at this point in time that uh, I know of three or four ministries that probably are not going to go ahead and they're valuable ministries that are not going to go ahead simply because we do not have pastoral support. I'm not talking about our pastor. I'm just talking about in general, uh, it's not just United Methodist pastors, but uh, we don't have the I know that Paris Outside had a hard time finding uh, pastors to serve on their weekend. They just had, but we have 
a Kairos weekend for prison ministry at, uh, down in Wilmot, and we don't have any uh, uh, clergy to serve on the team. And they generally have, uh, for every two team member, two lay team members, there should be a clergy member. So um, there's, and there's some other activities that uh, we need uh, support for. So it's not just lay people that are. Uh, <laughs> have a hard time giving up time that you and uh, our clergy are having a hard time uh, giving up time and that sort of thing. And well, also, is there possibly there's like a short there's a shortage? There is a shortage of clergy at this point in, time, in all denominations, basically. So, yeah. Um, so, but there that's a time that is time related. Uh, other resources involved as well. Not real cheap to go to seminary. Uh, and, uh, Tony was telling me a story today in a couple of his churches. He had young people that were very gifted and, and were feeling like uh, Jesus was calling them into the ministry. And after he sat down and told them what the path would be for them to to go into uh, ordained ministry, he said it seemed like Jesus stopped talking to them. Uh, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Um, there's a lot of roadblocks, a lot of obstacles in terms of getting into ministry. So that's maybe maybe that maybe we're not fulfilling. Maybe the church isn't fulfilling the, uh, the purpose that God intends for us in that. Um, how do you uh, when you think of worship? Um, where do you think of worship taking place? Why people are? No, most people think of it taking place at church in a building. Yeah, in a building. I think many of us do. Yeah. yeah. But where I, I I sense that you guys have already caught on that uh, that worship occurs <laughs> all the time. Uh, that that it is. Uh, worship is in how we live out uh, our live out our lives. The, it, worship occurs in the decisions that we make uh, uh, on, a, on a daily, moment by moment basis, um, and uh, that's uh, this idea. I think is is really key uh, that as he described it, the idea of the purposes of God. And the right hand, the understanding uh, that God is a God of action. It's, it's not just a something that is, that is uh, passive. Uh, God is an, an active God to have God's purposes fulfilled. Uh, and the remarkable thing, I think, that, that the Wesleyan movement helped to elevate was that uh, God allowed us the freedom to be a part of it. Uh, uh, and that uh, we, uh, we can choose to get on board with God's purposes and uh, God offers us, offers us that, that freedom. And uh, I think we'll get more deeply into that theology as we go uh, in our next session. But um, we have an opportunity to be part of God's right hand. In, uh, in doing it, I, I think sometimes we think that that worship is is just uh, singing songs and praying, uh, and that's that's a part of it. That's part of it. I think it's a neat part of it. But uh, one of the things that some churches started here not too long ago, which I thought was uh, um, helped helped us think outside the box a little bit, was we started what's called workship. Uh, and so on Sunday morning, you come in your work clothes and and you go maybe clean somebody's yard up who, who can't do yard work, or you go to a homeless shelter and you feed somebody, or you do, do some kind of action on Sunday morning to honor and to, to glorify, glorify God, to show that it's, it's not just a work of our voice, it's a work of our hands and our whole 
whole being, all the resources that, that we have. And uh, I felt like that that was a, uh, yeah, you don't do it every Sunday, but, you know, to do that four or five times a year to remind you that uh, real worship begins when you walk out of the door. <laughs> After you have worship, the real worship then begins uh, as uh, you enter the daily life to, uh, uh, to do God's, God's purpose. Well, you know, all these, there's a question that a Jewish atheist, you know, put to me many years ago, a doctor of social work, that was a friend of mine, and he was very familiar with the Bible. And, you know, especially all these images of the four creatures all worshiping God and throwing their crowns and around everybody's bowing down. Do we really think that God, it's not God that needs that, you know? God doesn't possibly need to see all these people bowing and scraping and throwing crowns at it. What need could God possibly have, we think, in terms of human need for such things? You know, obviously God doesn't need that. So it must be that we need, you know, that's what we need. I think we need, but I also think it goes to that God has created a freedom in which we have a role to play in all of creation. Uh, as, as we said, this, these, these beings, uh, these four creatures, represent all of creation. Um, and uh, God has, has allowed us an opportunity to be involved in creation. Uh, it, it's given us the ability to be part of creation, uh, to, to make decisions associated with the, the well-being of creation to try to further God's, God's purposes. And as I, uh, as I have uh, read it, I think we'll get there and maybe I'm jumping ahead a, a bit. Uh, God's uh, purpose really is shalom. And we think, we think of shalom as being um, just peace. Well, the wind's not blowing, uh, or um, we're not fighting one another. Then we must be at peace. But shalom is is much deeper than that. And shalom involves all of creation. It doesn't just involve human beings. Human beings affect shalom mostly negatively. It appears in my lifetime, anyway. Uh, but uh, uh, but when when we talk, talk of what is God's purposes here? God's purposes is one of shalom. Create. Uh, what did the writers of Genesis uh, when they describe uh, in the second creation story? What is when when I when I mention the the word Garden of Eden, what what kind of images do you have of that? An apple tree. An apple tree. Okay, but okay. paradise. Paradise. Okay, so shalom is part of paradise. Uh, I mean, paradise. It would mean that the animals and the beings and the creatures and everything that's in in that. Uh, garden are in harmony in some some way. I mean, there's uh, uh, there conflict. Is shalom. Lack of conflict, but it's even deeper than lack of conflict. It, we're, we're, it's more. It's more like we're really all working together. <laughs> you know, we're symbiotic, so to speak, uh, in the in the fact that. Uh, it amazes me today the the uh, our inner systems, our digestive tract, to be a little more uh, specific. Our digestive tract it is inhabited by all kinds of bio bio uh, flora and fauna. <laughs> We are a veritable zoo uh, on our on our insides, and when when those beings are not working together properly, we don't feel good. <laughs> and and you could kind of use that same imagery to, to think of 
when everything's working together, that's shalom. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, you had a comment, George. Has it been too long and you forgot about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somebody else used the word. Okay. Well, I have one before we go too much farther. At the top of page 35, um, the Lamb with the seven eyes that are the seven spirits of God. What the heck can that represent? You're, you're on page 35. Mm -hmm. At the top, line four. The end. Oh, line three. Well, the idea, the idea of uh, the later description, of the, and he's talking about a description that occurs in uh, chapter 5, uh, uh, verse 6. Um, that whenever you use, whenever you see the word seven, what, what, uh, what's, what's that reference? Huh? Totality. Totality, yeah, all of it. So in essence, the seven spirits would be, you know, the totality of God's presence. Basically, that God's presence is everywhere. All the, and he talks, it's kind of the same thing. He's using that to amplify, I think, what he said above is that the fullness of the eyes, doubly noted, seems to represent the omniscience and the omnipresence of God, yeah. which basically is the same thing as being said. Uh, with the use of the term seven spirits is the omnipresence of God. Where does that derive from? Where does the three derive from? Where does the seven spirits go down? That's Jewish uh, tradition, I guess. Uh, Jewish symbology. If you if you went online and, and uh, well, it's not just symbology, it's numerology. If you went online and you said uh, Hebrew or Jewish numerology, you would see a list of what, it, you know, three has a significance, two has a significance because it's the absence of one and three. Uh, six, the you've heard the terms, uh, the beast has the title 666. You know, well, that's it. That's, first of all, three which is a totality uh, or a completeness and then the absence of one makes something totally bad uh, uh, so if it was 777 seven, seven, it would be totally good but because it's 666 six, six, it's totally bad uh, so that's that's part of the, the numerology uh, and it's and it's Hebrew or, and it probably even goes back deeper than that, but in its Old Testament, uh, you could probably find that in, in uh, Daniel to a certain degree. You can find it in Isaiah somewhat uh, in their uh, imagery and numerology. But uh, if you search online and just uh, search for uh, Hebrew or Jewish numerology, you'll, you'll get a list of all of that. Like 40 days and 40 nights. Yeah. And uh, 144 and the 12 tribes of Israel squared. 40 is is just a long time. Whether it's 40 seconds or whether it's 40 minutes or 40 years, it's a long time. Uh, and so uh, it's it's not chronological. It's 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 Kairos. It's Kairos time. Not uh, you know, literal, literal in, in that aspect. You know, Jesus is forty days in the wilderness. He was in the wilderness a long time, and he got really hungry. Uh, you know, so that's that's the the uh, the forty uh, representation. Uh, Can I lend a joke? Sure. You know why the, the Hebrews were forty 
Years out in the wilderness desert, trying to find the promised land. Go ahead. They were men and they wouldn't ask for directions. For directions. <laughs> they had a full tank of gas. <laughs> you can do a lot of circles and not a full tank of gas. Yeah. Well, and and see the, the other uh, the other. Uh, I guess uh, use of 40 is it's as long as it takes and so the the 40 years in the look it's as long as it took for them to be ready to to go into the promised land and so it took them that long to be ready to do uh, what God was calling them to do or what God was calling them to become uh, so that that 40 uh, has, you know, could be a long time, but it also is, again, the Kairos time. It's as long as it takes to, to complete God's purpose. Uh, and, and again, when we talk about worship, we're, we're tied into purpose and action and uh, free will and all of that, all of it. So, um, well, uh, other points. Keep me from talking here. Come on, please. No. Um, but just to, just to re just to reiterate on on page thirty six under the scroll, uh, much of what I'm uh, sharing with you is in that that little paragraph there. Um, so much attention is usually given to the scroll that its location is almost totally overlooked. Significantly, the scroll, scroll is in the right hand of God. The right hand of God is an image of the action of God and the full fulfillment of God's purposes. We see uh, one of the things that uh, a lot of times in our prayers and in our liturgy, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Right hand of God. He seated at the right hand of God because he is God's action guy. Uh, he's seated at the right hand because that's the it's we sometimes put a good and bad connotation to that, but I don't think that does it totally total justice. I think it's I think he's got the point here that uh, this image suggests that the scroll of God's right hand has something to do with the purposes God enacts. Not just the purposes that he hopes will occur, it's the purposes that God enacts. E N A C T S. What he does, uh, he's a Nike guy. He just does it. You know? and, Since, and, he, and he's not even a guy. <laughs> you're right. The spirit has no gender. Yeah, no gender. Uh, since the opening of the scroll discloses the fullness of God's action with respect to both the rebellious and the redeemed orders of life, the scroll represents the totality of the purpose of the Creator in response to the rebellion of the creation. This representation is why no one in the created order, neither in heaven or on earth or under earth, was able to open the scroll or to look into it. God's purpose rises above the created order. It is not to be found in the dynamics of the created order, but within the nature of God. Only the Lamb is able to open the scroll because the Lamb is at the very center of God's purpose. It's almost as if, it's almost as if Jesus and the scroll, if you want to use a Zen term, Jesus and the scroll are one. Uh, they're very closely uh, associated um, the uh, I think another part of our understanding of worship uh, so much so much of worship today is about It's about making God 
our general so that we can go out and do battle with fallen Babylon. And even, uh, even uh, movies like The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, the Narnia series, which good children's stuff, but bad theology. Uh, not total bad theology, but the fact that the children participate in the uh, battle against uh, you know, bad witch uh, is not what we're going to see in, uh, in the book of Revelation because Jesus is the one who has, has uh, conquered. Jesus is the conqueror, the one that uh, addresses fallen Babylon and addresses fallen Babylon through the gospel. The gospel is the, uh, the sword uh, that is in Jesus' mouth. And we, again, I'm getting ahead, but it's, it's hard to talk about Revelation and talk about this vision without looking at the whole book of Revelation, looking at it chapter to chapter is sometimes a little difficult. Um, but <clears throat> our, our Savior, the one that we glorify and bow down to, uh, we cast our crowns around the throne, but that also incorpor incorporates Jesus, the Lamb. And what is it about a lamb that is so different than, than what we are in our world? Gentle, non-combative. Gentle, non-combative. Mm -hmm. Almost defenseless. Mm -hmm. Jesus is God and the shepherd. So Jesus is our shepherd. He cares right. for us. But that, and that's that's the analogy. But do we really buy into that? <laughs> See, that's. I guess my point is that when I uh, I saw a, a metaphor, a mega church back uh, in, the, in some other part of the United States. They were getting ready to do a fund campaign to build a building. And the pastor had a very unique message. He had on, on stage in his preaching, he had a ladder. And his idea was, he kind of he started giving his message. He stepped up on the ladder a few rungs. But then when he got to the heart of his message, the heart of his message was moving down. Going down. Uh, not elevating ourselves, but elevating God. Uh, lifting others up by, by us uh, lowering our, our, ourselves. And I think one of the places where the Christian church has co-opted with fallen Babylon, with our society, is we want power. We want the church to have power. We want to have power. And, and that's not our role to have. There's only one, when, when we speak of the church, there's only one place that power stands. Where is that? With God. Exactly. And so, uh, when when we have to be very careful, I think, in terms of our worship, is that we're not asking God to come uh, give us the power to to overcome. We may want God to give us the ability and the grace to overcome the world via his word, his gospel, his peace, his shalom. Uh, and so uh, I invite you, that's one of the reasons why 
Onward Christian Soldiers is not one of my first first choices again. Uh, because it's uh, because I think it it lifts us up into a, a place of power. Now, again, grant, grant him, and I'm sure that it has honored God in, in ways. But we need to be conscious of that in our worship. That we're not elevating ourselves, nor asking God to elevate ourselves. That we need to be about that. Part of that casting crowns down is casting power down. You know, we talked about uh, pocketbooks being hard to give up. One of the other things that's hard to give up is our power, our authority over uh, someone. And that's, that's very difficult for, I think, <clears throat> our, in our culture, not necessarily in other cultures. And more difficult for men, probably, than for women. There's a place where women really do need to understand that they do have power, uh, that God does empower them uh, in ways. And, uh, but so it does have some uh, gender specific terms. But power is one of the things that we uh, need to turn over to God. Uh, generally, when we have power, what do we do with it? Abuse. abuse it. <laughs> want more. Exactly. We want more. Yeah. Oh, I, I wanted to mention that I, I always one thing that I love to acknowledge is stunning paradox that is not understandable from a human viewpoint is that Jesus is both the lamb and the shepherd. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Both. He's also the, He's the, the second. Lamb and the lion. In, in the Lion of Judah. Yeah. Yeah. We can't really understand that. How can no, yeah, that's right. Lamb be the shepherd? Yeah. You know, just doesn't make sense. That's why I chuckle when somebody tells me they've got their faith all figured out. <laughs> when they have their faith all figured out, I, I chuckle a little bit because there are so many paradoxes that we have to, to try to understand, but know that in many cases they're beyond us. Please, Lord. <laughs> please, Lord. That's right. If, if, it, what, if, we, if we didn't have questions, it would be assurance. <laughs> and, uh, but our assurance is in the God that loves us, the God who has, has called us forward. Uh, I think our faith comes in trying to figure out what where we fit into this purpose right here uh, become one of our difficult choices. Uh, <clears throat> and I think we've already hit on it, but it's always worth hitting it again that um, the praise and worship of God is the structure in which God is enthroned. We should also begin to understand that the worship of God is not merely an outward observance, but a deep inner orientation of being by which God is enthroned in the totality of one's life. And so when we talk about it, God is enthroned in the totality of our each of our individual lives, that we should think of it in the same way when we talk about our church. God needs to be the one that is enthroned by our church, I mean, that needs to be our our focus of worship, uh, the totality. Uh, worship of God takes place in the presence of the realm of. Again, what was the problem with what was the problem with uh, uh, Ephesus? Uh, they were very. They lost their first. Yeah, they were. They thought they were doing everything right. What What had they done to the community around them? They closed them out. They had shut themselves off from that. So they really weren't worshiping in the midst of their culture. They had created their own little isolation, so that they didn't have to deal with the what God calls us, but our worship actually is to take place in the presence of the realm of the rebellion. 
And the quality of worship determines one's citizenship. So we can't ignore we can't ignore the culture in which we come out of. Uh, one of the courses that was was taught uh, at seminary when I went through was the enculturation of, of Christianity and how the Christianity we've received over the centuries has gone from one culture to another culture to another culture to another culture and and it's, and it's adapted. Every time Christianity goes into a new culture, it in some way becomes slightly enculturated, maybe sometimes more than, more than just slightly. So uh, you cannot separate our faith from the, from the culture. We're tied up in that. But what what helps our worship is to keep God on the throne of our lives. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, their um, their heart in God's realm. They, what, they, what do you mean by necessarily in culture? Well, let me see if I can. When, when you go, let's say, when, when the missionaries from our when the missionaries from the United States uh, goes to Africa uh, and they begin to tell the story. Uh, first of all, well, let me back up. What did Paul do? What did Paul do when he went to Athens? He told them about the unknown God. Right. He walked through the, the Agora, the center of town, and he looked and he saw what it was, what their culture was like, who it was that they, that they uh, worshipped. And, and they were, and he said, you are a very religious people. You know, he, he acknowledged their, their bent to be sure that they were worshipping, uh, worshipping God. He said, now let me tell you about the real God. But he used their um, he used their culture and their understanding of God and worship uh, as he told them the gospel. And he tuned the message to their culture. He tuned the message to the culture. You use you use the metaphors from their culture uh, to describe. You use the symbols from their culture to describe. But but the, the heart and purpose of God has to stay the same. We love one another. The, the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And, and love your neighbor as you want yourself. See, that... That's the gospel. That has has to stay. How we play that out is uh, is affected by by the culture. But that's our values. The values is that we care for one another. Uh, if if the cultural values uh, um, are that we take care of ourselves, we let we let them take care of themselves. We're, we're we don't have any responsibility. If that's the cultural value, then now we have a conflict between the Christian value and the, and the cultural value. What I'm saying in Laodicea is they allowed the cultural value to have reign over the Christian value that they, that they have. And, and that's what it, you know, maybe, maybe the Laodicean church said it's okay for us to have power and wealth. It, sound, it sounds to me like uh, what what Jesus was describing in Laodicea was that they were quite wealthy. Mm -hmm. They belonged on, they lived along a trade route, two trade routes, that they had uh, uh, 
they had some mills that did fine cloth that made people very rich and then they basically wanted all of the fine stuff that the culture around said should have instead of taking care of the poor instead of taking care of the disadvantaged instead of taking care of those that Jesus called them to take care of so so they they bought into the values of the culture instead of the values of, of uh, the gospel it, I mean, it, anybody got <laughs> that's my way of saying it <laughs> Um, it reminds me of the story, I think somewhere in Africa, where they tell the story, um, you know, when um, trying to describe the love of the father for his child, would he give his child a snake? Well, in some cultures, a snake is a good thing to have. Yeah. So <laughs> they have to put something that yeah. is negative in place of the snake in certain cultures. Yeah, you have to use the... the uh, and I think we understand today that there was much among our native people's cultures in, our, in this country that was very much in harmony and in tune with, with the gospel, but we failed to see it and understand it. And we wanted, we wanted them to adapt our culture as much as we wanted them to adapt the, the faith and the gospel. And so, Most of all, we wanted to take their land away. Yeah. <laughs> it's the power thing. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, that uh, we could go down the road a long way there. Uh, the. Uh, but I think, the, are there any other uh, comments associated with uh, the worship? I, uh, I put over here some papers uh, that uh, I, will, I will put these out in an email, but since, since I have plenty of copies, I will, I will share the hard copies. Uh, these are additional helps, which is just additional things for you to read when you have all this time. Uh, <laughs> I realize. Uh, but uh, the first, the first, uh, the top sheet basically talks about. I put this on the board the other day, and then we didn't have a chance to talk about it. It talks about the structure uh, of uh, it talks about the structure of, of Revelation as as Dr. Mulholland understands it, and so as he says, there's very little agreement today on what the structure is, but this is what he sees in terms of the structure of of the Book of Revelation and how. Um, and uh, he sees that at the heart of the at the heart of Revelation is uh, chapters 11 through 15, where there's he says the big picture. That's that's the heart of uh, the story. And then uh, the work the leaders guide that I have at the end of each one of the sessions has what's called a uh, additional Bible helps and that's what I printed out uh, the, uh, the page 23 uh, has some additional Bible helps for the lesson tonight um, and then uh, the next two pages have additional Bible helps for chapters 5 and 6, which is next week's uh, study. So, I, again, it's not mandatory reading, but you, if you have some questions or something you're reading, you might, might want to look at this, and it may give you some additional explanation that you don't have in your, in your workbook. So, 
uh, uh, depth. I'm just sharing what's uh, uh, what I have available. In, in this. New understanding. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just want to say that one of the things I find the hardest to get straight is they use the number like seven churches and seven comments and seven seals and seven bowls, and they mean different things. I'm sorry, I'm confused. I mean, you know, I mean, seven churches and seven. Well, again, seven. Yeah, again, that's it's the hardest thing for me. Uh, the the bowls. The bowls are generally woes. Um, okay. Woes, generally. Hurts, <laughs> pains, difficulty. agony, uh, the difficulties. Generally, that, uh, that's what the bowls are. But, uh, and then uh, the seven trumpets, uh, um, you know, we talked about the seven seals today, tonight, uh, uh, and that'll be more fully explained, but it's it's that the seven seals on the scroll are to show that nothing can be added or subtracted from it. I mean, it, it's, it's, well, there's, there's, there's also the fact that the scroll is written on both sides. The scrolls are never written on both sides. They're only written on one so that so that the ink doesn't fade, uh, but uh, the uh, this scroll is written on both sides and has seven seals on it, which means you can't get into it and you can't add anything. It's it's locked. Uh, now uh, it's locked to us. It isn't locked to to God. So that's the, the key element. Uh, the, uh, but the, again, the idea of seven is there is a, is a completeness. Uh, when we get into the uh, seven trumpets uh, and then the, the seven bowls, uh, it, it gets really messy. And uh, what we'll try to do next week is, is just try to hit some high points that may, that may clear things up a bit. I look at I look at what you're going to read in chapters uh, uh, six, six basically six uh, six through eleven. I think is what it, and it's not a lot of a lot of reading, but what what you're going to see, I believe, uh, as your workbook will I think describe, you're not seeing what's going to happen. You're seeing what is happening through fallen Babylon, which God allows because of God's free will. So, if in uh, in the uh, in the free will system that we as Wesleyans understand, uh, God doesn't need our God doesn't need our worship. God wants our worship. God or wants our love. God wants wants us to be in line with God's purposes, so that all of the stuff that we see happening <laughs> under these seven trumpets, seven riders, all of these these things, if we were in harmony with God's purpose, in other words, if all of creation was living in New Jerusalem, we wouldn't have those things. But God has allowed free will, which means that some people have the freedom to ignore and to do their own thing and not go to uh, see God's purposes. I think the reason, you know, that God wants the worship, you know, our worship and so forth, is so that we won't have to suffer. Right. Very good. Well said. 
That's exactly the point. That if, if we are in harmony with God's purpose, suffering will cease. Shalom. The absence of suffering. So, when you're reading, I think when you're reading these next few verses, don't read it as if this is stuff that's going to happen. Think about in your mind how this is happening today and how, how it's what what in our world and what in, in the culture that we call fallen by what is what is behind that. I think it makes a lot more sense when we think of it that way. And and if you know we could say, ah, that's right. That's what happens, you know. When we build more military and more guns and and we create uh, weapons that you know will destroy. Uh, you know, we look in here and we say, "Well, a third of the a third of the wor uh, world has been destroyed." Yeah, we're doing it right now in, in South America and in Africa and in other places. So, um, so uh, it's I think it's more reasonable when we read some of this as as present tense more so than something future. That's how it says to me as I was reading through it recently. So. <coughs> okay. Would anybody like to close this with a prayer? I'm going to let you out by this week. Somebody want to close this with a prayer? Come on, Ramona, you can pray us out. Thank you. <laughs> Precious Lord, we're so grateful uh, to be here tonight to delve into your word and to try to get better insight into why our world is the way it is and how you would like us to help us do better. Precious Lord, uh, give us the speed to get us out there safely. And, uh, Help us to look for ways to help somebody. Every day to see God. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ramona. Thank you all. And, uh, I know uh, Donna Magnus uh, wasn't here tonight. She either, evidently ate something or something. She was. She didn't sleep last night and was having a rough day. So and that's why she isn't there. And I think Becky, keep Becky Coward in your prayers with her granddaughter. Uh, I haven't heard any further words than what I heard Sunday. 